When it came to slavery in the United States, Christianity chose primarily to grapple with it on biblical grounds. As I've known before, uh, because of the widespread influence of evangelicalism, biblical literalism, especially from a very reformed Protestant perspective, was the dominant mode of reading the Bible in 19th century America. The exceptions to this within a Christian space would be the Roman Catholic Church, uh, forms of Lutheranism, aspects of the Episcopal Church, and um, smaller sects like, say, um, the Shakers, uh, the Quakers. They all might not read the Bible purely from a literalist perspective. But by and large, the Bible was read with the assumption of its literal meaning is its primary meaning and indeed its authoritative meaning. And to oppose a literal reading of the Bible was understood to willfully distort the word of God. And so the problem we have then is that the Bible on a literal reading appears to approve of the practice of slaveholding. We have it uh, throughout the Old Testament. We have it referenced in the New Testament. We have the Paul's letter to Philemon, which appears to be a defense of slaveholding by Christians. Jesus himself talks about slavery as a social given and never seems to explicitly condemn it. Any reading of a Christian condemnation of slavery then would have to move outside of a literal mode of reading the Bible. And so abolitionists then have to grapple with this question of, to support the abolition of slavery, does that require abandoning these traditional literalist views of biblical authority? So with that background in mind, we're going to explore both um, how a pro-slavery Christian argument worked and then look at how Christian abolitionists operated, and then we're going to look specifically at how African-American Christians spoke from themselves on these questions. So uh, I find this uh, distasteful to do, but I do need to explain how pro-slavery Christianity operated in terms of an argument. So in this context, slavery um, as an institution is defended by this appeal to literal readings of scripture. And so we find an example of this uh, by a Presbyterian minister from Virginia by the name of George Armstrong. And he, uh, you had some readings of selections from some of his arguments uh, for class. And he actually says slavery is a form of justice. And he has a quote here from his text, The Christian Doctrine of Slavery. He writes, quote, it may be that such a slavery regulating the relation of capital and labor, though implying some deprivation of personal liberty, will prove a better defense of the poor against the oppression of the rich. So his argument is that uh, all forms of labor exploitation exist, and we're beginning to see the, the development of the factory systems and the factory towns, and he points to these uh, industrial zones as their own sites of real exploitation of workers by uh, owners of these mills. And he argues that slavery is actually a way of uh, ensuring that the enslaved is not oppressed in the same way that these factory workers are. Uh, I find this a very difficult argument to grasp conceptually, but it's one that he does. It requires assuming that enslaved African Americans uh, cannot take care of themselves, that they in some ways operate as constantly in need of others to defend and protect them. So this sort of argument takes away the self-determination and agency of uh, people of African descent. So it is an inherently racist argument. Armstrong, as he goes on, 
supports uh, uh, this biblical uh, view of slavery while arguing against the incidental evils of slavery. So what might these incidental evils be? Uh, I guess we could say uh, whipping people who've escaped. Uh, first time you escaped, you were whipped. Second time you escaped, you had your hamstrung cut. The third time you escaped, you were hung. I suppose that might be one of the incidental evils Armstrong means. Or perhaps he means incidental, incidental evil of uh, sexual assault and rape or the forced separation of families. These are all what he calls incidental evils that uh, are in some ways besides the point of a biblical endorsement of slavery. Again, I think we need to see the inherent racism and white supremacy of the argument that Armstrong is making here. Moreover, Armstrong goes on to say, you know, the church really ought not to be involved in politics at all because this violates God's divinely ordained separation of these two spheres of church and state. So you see how this kind of American republicanism and this theistic moral pragmatism that wanted to reduce everything to common sense reasoning and assume that the government will have no uh, role in the affairs of the church, well, then he flips it to say, well, the, then the church has nothing to say to the affairs of the government. And so we've gone very far from the two swords theory of medieval Europe to really the separating out of these two spheres. But what Armstrong is doing by making this argument is making it impossible for a moral critique of slavery to itself be advanced that resistance of a moral critique of slavery, again, is rooted in economic interest, and the economic interest drives towards a racialized and racist creation of hierarchies between white enslavers and the black folk who are enslaved. On the flip side, we need to consider the Christian abolitionist movement and think about their arguments. And they, again, need to make these arguments outside of, uh, of an appeal to a literalist interpretation of Scripture. Or rather, they need to say that there are other ways of reading the text for what it means. And so what abolitionism is doing is channeling these various revivalist impulses. They have this vision of America as God's perfect and elect nation. And what abolitionists do is take that ideal and say, this will not be the perfect and elect nation until the evil of slavery itself is eliminated from this country. The core argument that abolitionists engage in is that to support slavery, a Christian must distort Christianity itself. That is, it has to recoil from the core commandment to love God, and to love neighbor. There is nothing in the practice of slavery that exhibits love of neighbor. In the beginning, abolitionism was seen as really radical. The first early abolitionist advocates, like a William Lloyd Garrison, um, are seen as too radical even in northern contexts that we often assume are just thoroughly abolitionists, that, that they were not. The development of Christian moral arguments is what sustained the abolitionist movement. And it's important to say right up front that um, uh, free Africans are at the very forefront of articulating and advocating for these abolitionist perspectives. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment when we look at uh, Absalom Jones and others. You read from Angelina Grimke, I believe, uh, her own appeal to Christian women of the South to embrace abolitionism and so to change the minds of husbands. And Grimke, she writes about slavery in the Bible as not at all being like what slavery is as it's practiced in the United States in her context. She would argue that this, these biblically mandated forms of slavery, or not mandated, these biblically allowed forms of slavery, uh, protect the rights of the enslaved it wasn't a perpetual form of slavery. There's all these various uh, conditions under which one could be liberated. So this is very unlike slavery as it's practiced in the United States. 
And so she would argue that, that the American slave system eliminates basic human rights and dignities, while all the relevant biblical passages about slavery are concerned about protecting the rights of the enslaved. And so she would argue, as with other abolitionists, that American slavery is an immoral system that has to be ended in its totality in order for the United States to live up to its calling as a Christian nation. And that's a lot of what fuels the moral energy for the endorsement of the Civil War. And we see this in um, Julia Ward Howe's composition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic that uh, often associated as a patriotic hymn, if you listen to it very closely, is filled with apocalyptic imagery of God purging the United States of the sin of slavery so that it might become God's perfectly elect nation. So as I mentioned before, African Americans are really at the forefront of the abolitionist movement. Uh, they are there before most white people are there in the early 19th century. You read um, a sermon that Absalom Jones uh, preached on the occasion of the end of the international slave trade, I believe. Uh, there he uh, argues how God intervenes in history to liberate African Americans from slavery, just as God intervened in history to liberate Egyptians from slavery. God comes down to visit the oppressed. And so this, I argue, is the very beginnings of black liberation theology, that God acts for the oppressed. And it's a rereading of America as Israel. African Americans, whether free or enslaved, know who the real Israel would be in this situation. It's them. They are like the Hebrew children enslaved in Egypt. And that makes America, as is found within the structures of power, not Israel at all, but Egypt or Babylon. A place of exile, a place of enslavement, a place where God will punish the wicked. And so this makes African Americans uh, frequent critics of both the United States with its hypocrisy about freedom, but also with white Christians who either support or are silent in the face of slavery. And so the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass would write, quote, Between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. Between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. Frederick Douglass says the Christianity of the United States is no Christianity at all. A Christianity that tolerates rape, torture, mutilation, kidnapping, all the forms of brutality, in the name of economic production is not Christianity at all. And any church that endorses such is not a church at all, according to Frederick Douglass. That is a critique, a moral voice, this echoing between the black church experience and the white church reality that we'll be willing to pay attention to for the rest of the semester. The intersection of blackness with gender identity is also a significant feature of the abolitionist movement. And so we see the figure of Sojourner Truth here. Sojourner Truth was born Isabel Baumfrey, an enslaved woman in New York, who was freed in 1827 when abolition is ended in that state. Isabel Baumfrey goes on to become what's known as an exhorter in the AME Zion Church, and later a member of a utopian community located in Sing Sing, New York. So we see in, in uh, Isabel Baumfrey, who gets renamed as Sojourner Truth, this constellation of all these various new religious movements that we've been talking about earlier in this unit. She's famous in 1851 for giving a speech uh, titled Ain't I a Woman, 
at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention. This is one of the very early meetings of the suffragist movement, the movement in which women seek all the claims of citizenship that men held. And so we see here these parallel movements for the claiming of dignity and citizenship between African Americans and women. And for both of those movements, this converges around ways of claiming the Christian gospel to ground their own assertion of dignity and self-worth. And so at the end of the day, the Christian struggle over slavery is, will you recognize this other person who is created in the image and likeness of God? And will you obey the command to love them as you love God?